Good morning, guys. Good morning. How are you feeling Thursday morning? Still, yeah. <laughs> Thursday morning, yeah. It starts to dip a little bit, but um, I heard karaoke was fun, so yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so today we're, I'm going to talk to you about the economics of Bitcoin. It's, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm excited, and it's an honor to you know, talk to you about this really extremely interesting, fascinating subject. Um, I teach, so I'm Dr. Malvik Anair. I teach at Troy University in the Johnson Center. If you've never looked up the Johnson Center, just you know, Google it, check it out. Um, we, we have an awesome group of faculty there, and we have an economics major and a master's program. Anybody um, interested in a master's in economics, we have a really cool group of faculty through the Johnson Center, and I teach in it. My husband teaches in it. Um, check us out. Um, so what I teach is money and banking. It's what I do, and so and graduate money and banking as well. So I'm really excited to be here and you know talk about the stuff that is so fascinating to me. So economics of Bitcoin. So before I start, how many of you have ever bought a Bitcoin or own a Bitcoin or? Okay, let's. That's not bad. So much better than my usual, you know, class. <laughs> but that's to be expected. Um, so, you know, I, I'm going to kind of focus on the economics of Bitcoin, you know, so I'm not going to get too technical. That's not what, you know, this is for. So just very quickly, we, I'll just go over so we're all on the same page. What is Bitcoin? Just a few basic technical aspects, and then we'll kind of get into the economics of it. Um, so what is it? It's this, obviously we all know by now, it was, it's this digital currency which is completely decentralized, right? Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, meaning that there is no one monopoly issuer, right? It's, it's kind of controlled by this protocol, this computer code that generates Bitcoin, and there's no one entity that has any control over it. It's basically this network of computers that is generating Bitcoin, and it's also verifying them. And that's what makes it so interesting, because typically when we think of money and fiat money specifically, you know, there's always one monopoly issuer. There's always a government that's there issuing it, backing it, right? And this is completely different. This is something that, you know, is basically, you know, come out, out of the market and it's completely decentralized. Um, what it does do, though, right, is solve what's known as the double spending problem, which is, which is a big problem when you have any kind of electronic data. So think about when you, you know, send an email or send an attachment on an email. Um, an attached file, right, you can send to one person and then you can turn around and send that exact same file to another person. For, no cost, right? It can be perfectly duplicated and sent to somebody else. And electronic data or sending value or money through the internet or electronically has the same problem. It's very easy to copy and to double spend. And this is the role that commercial banks play. They play the role of a third party where they stand in between people trading with each other, and they keep the ledger. This is what, right? So when you log into your debit account or your checking account online, you have, right, every sale that you've made or every purchase that you've made, right, all the money's debited, it's gone into somebody else's account. That's what that commercial bank is doing. They're keeping a ledger, they're keeping account, okay, of all that electronic money. Otherwise, if, if it was just, again, if it was just us paying each other, we could easily be double spending with each other. Now, the way Bitcoin kind of deals with that problem, right, again, there's no third party, there's nobody watching. The way Bitcoin deals with it is through what's known as the blockchain, which is this completely, so it's instead of having a monopolized third party watcher who's, who's kind of maintaining this ledger, it's this completely publicly verifiable ledger. So it's like everybody's watching, okay? Everybody's watching this ledger, which is called the blockchain, which has, which is basically a record of all transactions that have taken place. Now, the other cool thing, of course, is that the way it's set up or the way the code is written, it's programmed to have only 21 million Bitcoin ever to be produced, okay? And currently, the amount that have been mined is about 16.5 million that are in circulation. Um, another very important feature, which we'll kind of come back to a little later, is the, the fact that it's based on an open source software and it's kind of, you know, economically significant. We'll come back to it. And the way that it works is that miners basically mine or generate Bitcoin by giving computing power to this blockchain, right? So you're verifying transactions, you're giving your computing power to the blockchain, and if you are the first one to mine a certain block or basically verify this group of transactions, you are rewarded with Bitcoin. So it's kind of like incentive compatible. There is an incentive 
for anybody, right? Anybody can become a miner. There's a monetary incentive. If you do it well, you are rewarded with Bitcoin, and that's what generates Bitcoin. But that's not it. That's also what actually keeps the ledger, the blockchain going. That is what's verifying the transactions. So it's kind of interesting, the, the incentives that are set up. Okay, so quickly, just you know, looking at the price, right? Um, so this is price starting back through time. So this is like January 09. This is when it's kind of, you know, um, when it got started right there. Obviously, it was like kind of nothing going on for a while. And, you know, nobody cared about it, right, of course. Here, um, this is when it got really interesting. It's like about $100, um, right? And this is actually right about when I bought a few Bitcoin, right about when... No, interesting. We'll come back to that story. <laughs> so this is when I got my hands on a few, and it was, um, and this is actually so. This was like July or September of thirteen, and I was actually teaching money and banking, and I told my students about it. And through the semester, this is by December, it, this had happened in that course, and I was like, "Look, I told you guys about this. You know, <laughs> you should have bought some. You know, uh, you would have made a bunch of money already." So, and then this happened. Of course, when this happened and that happened, you know, people. People have been saying, look, it's a bubble, it's a bubble, it's going to burst, it's going to burst. The point is, look, bubbles don't do this, you know. Bubbles don't go up and then come down, then kind of go up and then hang around and then stay and then go up again, and you know, right? Um, that doesn't happen. This is not a bubble. Whatever it is, it's definitely not a bubble, right? I mean, there's a lot of people, every time anything happens, you know, a lot of people kind of come out of the woodwork saying, oh, it's going to fail, it's going to fail. It's, you know, it's still around. Um, so it's definitely not a bubble. Um, this is just... Uh, kind of metric of how many wallet users there are. And it's, again, it's, I think it starts in 2012. And again, you can see it's kind of, you know, always been growing. So kind of get, giving you an idea of, okay, it's, it's hanging around, right? But is it just being used for speculation or is it actually being used as a currency? Is it actually being used, you know, to do stuff, to buy stuff? And it is. Um, this is, again, this is the number of confirmed transactions per day. It's kind of, you know, obviously a very positive trend. Over time, it's kind of been going down recently. I'm not sure why, maybe because of the price increase. Um, so obviously, it's not just a bubble. It's not just being used for speculation. There, is, there are people who are buying it. They're holding on to it. And they are using it to transact. Okay? Um, that's the data that we have. Now, so the first question I want to kind of think about is, OK, is this money? What does economics tell us? Can we say Bitcoin is money? Is it money at all? Right? What, what makes money money? Right? How, how do we define money? Um, and basically, Money is something that's you know, extremely interesting. Money is defined by its function. It's not kind of defined by its form. So if you think of, you know, what is an apple? An apple, you know kind of like what an apple is, right? An apple is an apple. A banana cannot be an apple. What is a car? A car has certain functions, has a certain form, right? A car cannot be a train. But what is money? Money doesn't have a certain natural form. Many different things can be money. So money is basically defined by what it does, which is fulfill its function as a medium of exchange. Now, what is a medium of exchange, right? It's something that you use to transact and to buy goods and services with. It's something that we hold on to only so that we can exchange it again to buy goods and services, okay? And so if we look through history, obviously so many things have been money, right? So many examples of different types of commodity monies. And now more recently we have fiat money, paper money, electronic money. So, I mean, there's no real reason why Bitcoin can't be money. Um, the basic question we kind of have to answer is, can you use Bitcoin today to buy and sell goods and services? Okay, and if you were just thinking of that, is it a medium of exchange today? Can you buy a bunch of things, right? Will people accept Bitcoin from you and give you goods and services in return? And the answer is yes, right? It is a medium of exchange. It is being used as a medium of exchange. It's not extremely widely used yet, so I wouldn't necessarily call it a currency, but it definitely is a medium of exchange, and it is a money, right? I mean, I think a, to be called a currency, it would have to be something that's extremely widely used, but again, there's no real clear definition there. But, you know, what, what can you buy with Bitcoin? Well, a lot, a lot of stuff today, right? I mean, meals, hotel rooms, gold, movie tickets, right? Um, anything on overstock.com, right? So overstock.com sells like, you know, about a million things, right? Any of those things, literally, you know, somebody will sell you for Bitcoin. 
And so that is what makes it a medium of exchange or a money. So it definitely is a money because money is what money does. And the fact that people will exchange and they're doing this voluntarily, right? That's what's interesting about it. Um, you know, which brings me to the next point. What type of money is it, right? Okay, if it is a money, then how do we classify it? How do we understand it? Because a lot of people, you know, of course, when it kind of came on the scene, and it's, it's so interesting, you know, to monetary economists, like, what is this? Is this a fiat money, right? Because it obviously does not have any other kind of value behind it. It has no intrinsic value. How do we, how do we understand this? So I like to think of it in terms of, Mises' classification of the types of money. And so he used three classifications. One was credit money, fiat money, and then commodity money. And we'll kind of go in through it in reverse. So credit money is anything, is money that is re going to be redeemable sometime in the future. Okay, But currently it is circulating and being used as cash. So credit money is not something that is very um, common anymore. It used to be at the time that Mises was writing. So it would kind of be like an equivalent of like a certificate of deposit, you know, circulating in exchange for goods and services. It's not something that people really do anymore. Um, fiat money, of course, this is, you know, we know what fiat money is, uh, but technically fiat money is something that is backed by a government and it is in circulation because the government, you know, puts, has a legal decree which says this, this is, legal tender, right? There are legal tender laws that backs it up. And because of because people have faith in their governments, you know, they trust and use this fiat money. And typically fiat money is also always paper money, right? Um, so what you see with fiat money is that the face value, like a $100 bill and a $10 bill have the exact same kind of commodity value to them, but they have a very different face value. But what's kind of backing it is the fact that there's a government, there is a monopoly power that is putting its faith into it. Now, the last one, which is commodity money, um, and Mises um, classifies it further into money proper and money substitute. So kind of to just give you an idea, what is a money substitute? So a money substitute today would be um, like your checking account balances. Okay, um, you know, every time you swipe your debit card, right, your checking account balance is going down and somebody else's checking account balance is going up. That checking account balance is a money substitute. Um, maybe 100, 150 years ago, there were banks would issue their own notes, bank notes, and those would be money substitutes. So you would go deposit your gold. The gold was the money proper, the commodity money, which had value of itself, right? A value in use, value outside of just the fact that it's a money. That's what a commodity money is. And the money substitute was basically a piece of paper that was redeemable for that money proper. Now, there's been, you know, a lot of kind of debate. So what is Bitcoin? Isn't, is, it, is it a money substitute? Is it, is it so-called inside money? You know, isn't it redeemable for dollars? And my view is that it's not. It's not an inside money. It is, it's just because there is a very well-developed market between Bitcoin and dollars doesn't make it redeemable for dollars. It, there's, a, there's a fine distinction there. Anytime when we use redemption or redeemable on demand, specifically with respect to monetary economics, what that means is you make a deposit of money and somebody promises to give you back that equivalent amount of money on demand, right? There's no price there. It's one for one, right? And that price, I mean, there is no price. That price cannot change. It's one for one. The difference between buying and selling Bitcoin so easily for dollars is that there's a price and that price fluctuates, right? And that's what tells you that, that that's not the same thing as it being redeemable. So it's not like Bitcoin is backed up in any sense by dollars. Just because you can buy and sell them so easily doesn't make it backed up, doesn't make it redeemable. Um, so, so Bitcoin is not that. It's not a money substitute, which kind of brings me to kind of by elimination, it's the closest thing it is, is probably commodity money. Um, it comes closest to commodity money because it kind of behaves like a commodity. It doesn't really have a strong value in use outside of the fact that it can be used as a currency. But I mean, the fact that, you know, people chose to hold it, you know, for speculation or for, you know, just for the fact that it was something that was cool, right, in the beginning, before it ever had any exchange value, right? People chose to hold it and to, right, just to buy it and hold on to it and see what will happen, right? So it did have some kind of value in use, although it's not that obvious, right? It's intangible. It's not something that we think of as a commodity, but the closest it comes to is a commodity money or what would be known as an outside money. Um, 
specifically for the fact that it's not backed up, it's not redeemable in any other thing, right? Um, and neither does it have any kind of guarantee from any government. Um, George Selgin actually has an interesting paper where he comes up with this term called synthetic commodity money to classify Bitcoin, which, is, I, think is, which I think is a useful term. Where he's saying it's exactly kind of like commodity money, but it's, it's synthetic. But it has most of those features that commodity money has. Now, the big question that, you know, this is the question that I find most interesting. Why does anybody use and trust this thing, right? Like, I mean, is it, is it that easy, right? I mean, is it that easy to like start a new currency tomorrow? I could do it, right? I mean, if, if you know, it's this thing up in the air, right? And people are just buying and putting money into it and it's fluctuating and it seems like it's a bad investment and why are people trusting it, right? And this is an important question to answer. And it's, it's so interesting because when it comes to a medium of exchange, the, the question of trust is important, okay? So if you think of a medium of exchange, right, versus a consumption good. So consumption good meaning anything that you would consume, right? Like, like a meal or a, or a car, right? You, when you drive your car, you're consuming the car, your house. You live in the house, you consume the house, right? Um, a medium of exchange is completely different. You only ever buy and hold on to a medium of exchange because you know that somebody else will take it from you and give you goods for it, right? So think of how difficult it is for a new currency, okay? Nobody's ever heard of this thing, right? Everybody already has their own money, okay? Why should anybody ever hold on to it, right? If I want to hold on to this and I need to trust somebody else will take it from me, right? But he has that same problem because it's a medium of exchange. If he's gonna take it from me, he needs to know that somebody will take it from him in exchange for goods and services, because this is the primary function of money. This is why we use money. We, d we never consume money, right? It's not like an ice cream. It's not like a car, right? It's not a consumption good. The only reason we ever use a new money. So how does a new currency ever get into circulation, right? People have to trust that somebody else will take it from them. This is a huge problem. Um, so trust, maintaining or creating trust and then maintaining it is, is key for any new currency. And it's, it's important for an old currency as well, right? You have, to, right, tomorrow if, you know, for some reason people lost faith in the dollar or if there was, you know, a massive amount of inflation, people would stop trusting it, right? I mean, something drastic would have to happen at this point, for, you know, with respect to the dollar, but trust is key for currencies. Consumption goods, on the other hand, it's not, I mean, it's important. You have to be able to trust the reputation of the person, but there's an easy test there, right? You consume it. If you like something, if you enjoy it, you buy it. And that's what creates the demand for the thing. But the demand for a new currency only comes from the fact that people know and trust that somebody else will take it from them in exchange for goods and services. And everybody has that same problem, right? So it's, it's why, so the question becomes, why, does, why did anybody ever start to trust this thing ever to begin with, right? I, I mean, and I think it's an important question to kind of think about and answer. So I think there's three um, features or characteristics of Bitcoin and the blockchain that kind of have lent themselves to why people trust it. So I don't think it's just kind of, you know, up in the air and it's, you know, fickle and, it, you know, today people trust it and tomorrow they won't. That's not where it's come from. I think, you know, people trust it for certain solid reasons, the one that are using it as currency. You know, there's solid reasons behind it, and those reasons are, you know, not going to, you know, change anytime soon. So the first one, of course, is the fact that it's a completely publicly verifiable ledger, right? Um, the fact that you don't need to trust any third party who has monopoly power over issuing that money. Nobody has that monopoly power, right? And the fact that everybody knows that creates trust because you know, even if you're never actually going to do it, you're like, okay, I'm going to look this up. Is this really true, right? Did when I sent Bitcoin to so-and-so, did it actually grow from, even if you don't actually check that up, the fact that you know that it is publicly verifiable, right? That helps create trust, right? That if you wanted to, you could, okay? The fact that you know that and everybody seems to verify that, right? That, that goes a long way to create trust in this thing. Um, the other one, of course, is that it's completely a public blockchain, which is one which is open to everybody, because now there's, you know, there's talk of creating private blockchains, which would be like internal to governments or to companies. But a public blockchain, which is what Bitcoin is based on, is completely open and free, right? There's free entry, there's free exit. So anybody can enter it, right? And then anybody can leave it. And again, that helps generate trust because it's completely decentralized and it's also geographically dispersed. Okay, so it's, 
no one country or no one nationality kind of has monopoly over it, again, and that helps generate trust. And the third one, which is the fact that it's based in open source code, I think is the most significant. So I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, what is open source software just very briefly? So open source software obviously has been around for a long time, right? Um, Linux is one of the famous examples. Um, kind of, let's think of the economics of it and how it works in terms of money. So economists have kind of thought about open source software, but never really in terms of how it applies to money. Um, so the two types of software that you can have is one which is completely owned, which is proprietary, like a Microsoft or an Apple, right? Which is, you know, the stuff that we use, all of us use. And it's owned, it's proprietary, obviously, right? It's, it's something that they charge a price for, it's not free. Um, there is a, they have ownership of the code and they also have control. They have rights over changing that code, right? That's proprietary software. So think of a Microsoft. Open source, on the other hand, is completely different, right? Anybody, it's, it's completely free, right? So today, any of you could, complete, could download you know, the Bitcoin code. If you wanted to help change and you know, give them suggestions of how to fix bugs, and you can do that. Okay, that's what open source is. It relies on voluntary contributions of basically the public to help keep it going and keep fixing it and making it better, right? Of course, the question which, you know, economists think about is like, that's a free rider problem, right? Why would you ever contribute to something that you're not getting a monetary incentive, right? You're not, you're not getting any gain from it, but you still contribute to it. And so there's a huge literature in economics which deals with, okay, how, does, how do we explain open source software given free rider problems, you know? And what they found is that people still voluntarily choose to contribute because they do, even though they're not paid for it, that they do, they can turn those experiences into like monetizable assets later. Like you can put it on your CV, you can go to Google and say, hey, you know what, I, I, I created this bug for an open source software. That means, you know, I'm pretty talented. And, you know, that, that that's how open source has been able to attract really, really talented individuals voluntarily supplying effort and time, right, to just keep this thing going. And that's what Bitcoin is powered by, right? Now, let's think of if a proprietary software like a Microsoft, right, tried to create their own currency, okay, tried to basically put it out there. You know, this is issued by us. This is whatever, you know, call it whatever. Now, think of the trust problem, right? Everybody knows that Microsoft is, is privately owned, it's privately controlled, right? That means you know that they have private ownership and control over that code. If they wanted to change it, right, they tell you up front, hey, you know, okay, whatever, it's 20, 21 million units, we're never gonna change it, you know, it's all set up just the same way, but you know that they do have power to change it and they do have power to manipulate it in, in their own favor, right? Because it's based on proprietary software. How many people do you think would trust it? not very many. That currency would not do very well. Now, Bitcoin, because of the fact that it is based on open source and the fact that everybody knows that it is based on open source is what goes a long way in the fact that people are able to trust it, right? Um, because no one person can change it to a, it's his own personal benefit. Um, there is change that can come about, but it's, it's complicated. It has to come through consensus, right? It has to come through many people agreeing on you know these complicated matters and in fact right now there's like this huge debate going on right um, which is all happening out in the public right about there's you know there's a big fork coming up and um, right that there's a lot of debate within the Bitcoin community within the developers right which way should we go should we increase the block size or should we go another way right and it's this is all part of the open source um, system and what is interesting is that, I'll, I'll come back to that in a bit, this, this, this way of decision making, right, where everybody kind of has to agree and no one person has power and it's all out in the public, it kind of seems really chaotic. Wouldn't it just be more efficient to you know, have a central bank, right? Like have somebody that has that power, that has the monopoly over creating decisions and you know, putting those things out there and just doing things or a Microsoft that has power to do things, right? Look at this craziness that's out there. Look at these Bitcoin people just fighting with each other right now. It seems chaotic, but it's actually extreme. It's what lends a lot of strength to the whole system of Bitcoin. It's, it's because of all this transparency is what leads to a lot of trust, right? It's because everything has to be 
out in the open. So even if, for example, even if the core developers wanted to kind of change the code for their own favor, in their own favor, it, they would have to do it in a public way. Everybody would know immediately that it was happening, right? And the moment that happened, most people would stop using it. And the thing is that it's kind of like game theory. Um, the developers know that they know this, right? That other people know that they would do this. So you don't do that because you know you'd be found out immediately and you would lose everything that you've built. That would be the end of Bitcoin, right? Because if, if you lose trust, if a currency loses trust, right? Especially something like this that's completely out of the market. There's no, you know, there's no central bank. There's no FDIC here, right? I mean, it loses trust, it's gone, right? And so the incentive, even if there is an incentive to cheat, to manipulate the code in your favor, it would... the the losses would be so great from doing that, right? That actually creates a disincentive to do that. And on the other hand, what's neat is, so the software itself is free, right? Obviously you don't make money off it. Obviously if you are contributing to the software, fixing bugs, you're not making money off that. What you can make money off is building applications, right? off of that open source code. So there's lots of, there's tons and tons of Bitcoin entrepreneurs out there right now, right? Today, building apps, building, right? Payment systems, right? Making money, making a lot of money, right? Being entrepreneurs, using that base code to build proprietary applications. And what happens is, is that those entrepreneurs tend to be involved in the development process itself. And so now they have actually an incentive to keep it working really well. Right? to keep it transparent, to keep it smooth, to keep it moving well, to, to show everybody that we're not manipulating this thing, right? Because they would be the ones to lose because they're making money off the fact that it is running smoothly because their applications rely on the fact that the open source code runs smoothly, right? So there's actually an incentive built in for them to make sure that the code is running smoothly, that it is transparent, that it is, right, that there isn't any kind of cheating going on. And all of this is what goes a long, long way towards the trust issue, right? Which is, you know, a big deal when it comes to money. Um, so think of, you know, contrast, you know, this weird open out there public consensus decision making with, you know, decision making that goes on behind doors in, in a central bank with discretion, right? So not a central bank that, you know, that's been bound by a rule, but that's been given discretion with which is what's been going on a lot, right? When there's secrecy and there's a lot of, you know, no, everybody doesn't know what's going on behind doors, how they're making their decisions, they've been given a lot of discretion, that actually leads to distrust, right? And, and so if you think of the Fed, right, most people, you know, and if you ask them their opinion of the Fed, you know, anybody, right? It's like, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't understand them, but, you know, they seem to have a lot of power, and, right? Which they do, right? Which they do have a lot of power, and they're able to make those decisions, of course, because they have the monopoly power, they make decisions, and if they do it in a discretionary way, it's what leads to distrust. And this is why there's so much push within economists for, you know, constraining central banks with a rule, right? With a rule that is public, with a rule that is transparent, and so that everybody hopefully will know the process of decision making. Um, so what are some of the advantages of using Bitcoin, right? You know, why, what are the private advantages of using it? So obviously it, it, um, it allows you to have a lot of privacy, right? You don't have to put a lot of, you know, any, your name, any of your public information out there. Um, you just have a password that you kind of have to keep safe and you have a unique public address and it's all through the use of cryptography, right? It's, it's, it's much, much more private than current credit cards and the credit card system or even PayPal, right? It's a lot of personal information out there, which is what leads to a lot of fraud every year. You know, the, the amount, the percentage of fraud and, you know, identity theft that goes on through the payment system internationally, it's, it's pretty large. And Bitcoin gives you that advantage where you're not putting any private information. And so that's, a, that's an obvious advantage. So, and plus, linked to that is, of course, the lower chance of fraud. Um, the biggest advantage, which is, you know, which is what has led it to be so successful, is the lower transaction fees for merchants, okay? It's the merchants or, you know, the shopkeepers, the hotels, right, that are like an overstock.com accepting Bitcoin. And why is that? Because they have a monetary incentive to do, to do it. Because every time you accept a credit card payment or a debit card payment as a merchant, you have to pay a 3% fee, to the credit card provider. And with Bitcoin, what a lot of these companies like BitPay and Coinbase have been able to do is process payments in the same way, accept Bitcoin, convert it to dollars immediately for the merchants, 
or, or keep it in Bitcoin if you want to, but for a much lower fee, 1% or less. Okay, and many times it's free, it's a 0%, right? So now if you're a merchant, it's like a no-brainer, right? I mean, why not just accept Bitcoin on the margin? Okay, I accept credit card payments, debit card, PayPal, Visa, whatever, plus Bitcoin, because if people do pay with Bitcoin, I'm gonna save two, 3% on every sale, which is big, which is actually a large part of your profit margin, right? Uh, when you're a business owner. Um, which is actually the key to the current success. So currently there are several hundred thousand merchants all over the world that accept Bitcoin. I read about something in Japan that there's about to be um, something like 250,000 more merchants who are gonna start accepting Bitcoin in Japan. That's kind of the key to the success. Um, and the other thing which is really cool is the ease of transfer, the speed of transfer. So I could send Bitcoin to you sitting right here in the same amount of time that I can send Bitcoin to somebody you know, across the world, basically, right? Which is, which is amazing, right? So if you think of, um, think of people in the developing world, people who do not have access to the traditional you know, financial systems that we, we just take for granted, right? Like a debit card, ATM, blah, blah, you know, it's whatever app on your phone. But these things don't exist in most of the world, in Africa, in Asia, and something like Bitcoin, where you just have to have a phone, right? You just need a phone, an app, and internet connectivity, right? Something like that, where you can send money across large distances, right? Which is safe, right? Because places which don't have a well-developed financial system, what you basically rely on is cash, or you rely on like expensive wire transfer, right? And or remittances, sending money back home. Those kinds of things are, you know, a huge, huge step up. Um, that's why, you know, we, you've heard of things like in, in Africa, things like M-Pesa and um, mobile money, right? That have taken kind of have become a big deal. But mobile money, again, is still, it's not, it's, it's, it's just a money substitute. It's not a money of its own. Something like this is more sophisticated and it's actually safer and faster. Um, okay, those are advantages. What about the challenges, right? So, uh, it's, you know, way more challenges than, you know, so Bitcoin has had a lot of success, right? But it's still not kind of anywhere close to being this, well accepted, you know, currency that everybody uses, and and that's, I mean, it's 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 done amazing for for you know where it started, right? Something like this, nobody thought would ever exist. Certainly not, you know, anybody who studies monetary economics. It's you know, it's fascinating the fact that you can go out and buy a bunch of things. It's it's pretty amazing the fact that people use it, they trust it. But is it is it a widely used currency yet? No. Is it going to get there? We don't know yet, and and maybe not. Um, the thing is, if you think of the United States or you think of any place which already has a, you know, well-functioning fiat money system with a central bank, I mean, it's really hard to overcome. So I'll talk about the network effect. It's really hard to overcome what's known as the network effect, right? So everybody is, it's like, think of like Facebook, right? Which is this huge network. Now, if a new social media or something wanted to kind of compete with Facebook, right? Or to take them over or to have people switch. I mean, that's really hard because everybody is connected, right? And the question is who moves first and why? There's a huge, what's known as a switching cost. Why should I ever switch from what I have already, which is working so well for me, to something new that I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to use it. Plus, I don't even know if I'm gonna have any of my other buddies on it. Why should I ever change, right? So it's kind of the same thing. Bitcoin faces huge incumbent the huge incumbent network effect of the dollar and any other major currency that is functioning well. That, and that's kind of the reason why it's been successful. Anytime that there is large amounts of inflation or hyperinflation or you know, countries that have seen political instability recently, that's where Bitcoin adoption rates have been increasing, right? Which is a good thing, right? Which is, which is a good thing for those people because now they have a choice. They don't have to lose all their savings or, or all their money just to, you know, the fact that their currency is being inflated away. They can hopefully save some of that by converting it into Bitcoin and hopefully, and then converting it into some other currency. But that's not the same thing as it being adopted you know, it's, it's not the same thing as it being adopted during normal times, right? And that's the real question. Do we see a shift from the dollar to Bitcoin? Well, I don't know. That, that's, you know, that's a difficult question. Um, and again, the biggest challenge, I think, is that right now there's no real monetary incentive to use it for consumers, for you and me, right? Like how many of us, so a bunch of us own Bitcoin, but how many of us use it to buy things? How many of you have used it to buy things? 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of my point, right? Like we buy it. Oh, this is cool. Like I'm gonna show my friends, right? Like I, <laughs> right? Like get with it, right? Like do you own Bitcoin? You know. But how many of us actually use it? No. Well, I mean, and it's. Part of it is, of course, it's kind of like confusing. Okay, how does this really work? Like, how do I actually do this, right? Um, the other part is that there isn't actually a monetary incentive the way there is for merchants, right? For merchants, it's clear. Like, you, you save 2 or 3% on every sale. You're going to start accepting that thing. And so if there were similar monetary incentives for consumers, so think of like, okay, if you pay with Bitcoin, like if Amazon said, okay, dollar price so-and-so, but if you pay with Bitcoin, you get 5% less you get a 5% lower price, which is basically a discount for using Bitcoin. I think, you know, more people would start to use it. We would take that, make that effort to, okay, how does this thing work? Am I saving 5%? I'm going to do this, right? Right? I mean, if it's a 5% cash back versus 3%, you know, you go for the 5%. So if there was some kind of monetary incentives, you know, and, and, and this may happen. It hasn't really happened yet. I mean, it, it happens... Sometimes, you know, there's like a Bitcoin um, Black Friday. So if you pay with Bitcoin, you can buy a bunch of things for super cheap. And, you know, and, and at those times you see a lot of people using and selling and, you know, paying with their Bitcoin. But because there's no clear monetary incentive, you know, consumers don't really have a reason to use it. And of course, the fact that, you know, it's, it's a high informational burden, right? So this is kind of like a biased group, right? But, right, I mean, it's kind of like a biased group and, you know, maybe 20, 30% of you, you know, own Bitcoin. But if you just go out, like, you know, I ask my students in my class and they're like, who cares? You know, I have my debit card. I have, I mean, my bank account is insured by FDIC, you know, I mean, it, I know that money's not ever going anywhere, right? It's safe. I mean, look at this thing, the, the, the value fluctuates. I mean, I don't, I don't want to buy it. I don't want it, right? And so it's, it's this huge informational burden on consumers, right? First of all, you have to understand it. You have to know how it works, right? You have to kind of keep up with what's going on, what's going on with the price, what's going on, right? And this is all kind of in an age where we're used to, right? We're used to having it easy. We just have ATMs and we have credit cards and debit cards, right? Uh, I mean, so this is coming back to the story of what happened to my Bitcoin. Uh, so, so that's what I bought it when it was a few hundred, it was, it was a hundred dollars, I bought a few Bitcoin. And, well, you have a Bitcoin and you have this gigantic password, right? Like, it, it's super long, right? And you need to keep that thing safe. And I lost the password. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's embarrassing, I know. So, I mean... But that's kind of part of the story, why it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, when people think of putting value and putting money into it, right, it's, it's inconvenient. You now have to keep that thing really safe, because if you lose that password, that Bitcoin's gone forever, right? I mean, it's not like when you check in, you know, you log into your checking account and you lose your password, they say, oh, did you forget your password? You can reset it, right? That money's not going anywhere, right? You're never going to lose it because you forgot a password, right? And so... I mean, true story, it happened to me, right? I mean, I try not to think about what it would be worth today. <laughs> yeah, I don't think about that. But it's, it's just a lot more work, which I think most people, right? This is a biased group, but, you know, most people in the population, they're not really willing to do that work when you have fiat money, you have FDIC that insures your checking account, you have a forgot your password, right? Never lose your money, right? Even e so that's what FDIC does, right? Even if your bank goes bankrupt, they will protect your money and they will pay you, right? Whatever's in your checking account, right? So what that does is create this huge burden. And I think over time what has happened is people are just kind of become complacent. You know, there, there's been, you know, in, in, in choice of monetary products, we don't really have money, right? You have fiat money, you have your one currency, and then, I mean, you have a choice in banks, but are they really that different? I mean, if all of them, you know, if FDIC insures all your checking accounts, any bank you go to, you're, right? It's not really different, right? Do you really care? Do you really, you know, check up on what they're doing with your money, right? And this is kind of the problem, right? So it's created, a, you know, historically so much um, lack of competition in any kind of, we, we don't even think that way, right? Monetary goods competing with each other, like that, that's not a possibility ever, right? And so just that has made, you know, every most people are complacent. And it's kind of 
hard to you know shake people out of that. It, it is, and it's it's even harder because it's a money, right? Again, if you think of like a consumption good, right? If if something had not had any competition that was kind of controlled, let's say like in a socialist country, like cars, right? You know, I'm from India. There used to be just one car. When it was socialist, there was literally one car. The government, you know, made this one car and everybody had this one car. Guess what happened when the country liberalized, right? And there was competition. There's like 10 kinds of cars, okay? Now, of course, people are kind of hesitant to, okay, you're hesitant to try something new. There's choice. There's new, com you know, there's competition. There's new things out there. But, I mean, you still try it, right? And if you're, you're like, okay, if I don't like it, I'll just go back to my old car, right? Guess what? Everybody has like, you know, everybody has either a Chevy or like, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a, like a Honda or a Hyundai or, you know, that's what everybody drives now in India, right? Because it's a consumption good. It's, it's much easier, right? The test is just whether it provides a value in use. And if it does, then you shift and you switch. But with a currency, the test is much harder because you're only going to use it if you know other people are going to use it, right? And so, and other people are going to use it if you're going to use it. So it's kind of this locked in thing, right? Plus, if it comes with these high informational costs, where Bitcoin, you have to know all these things and know what's going on with it, and right? And you may lose money if its price is fluctuating, right? It's, there's these huge, these are the challenges and the hurdles that it faces. Um, and that's kind of why I think that if, if there were more applications that actually offered customers a monetary incentive for using it, right? Like if there was an app that you could download and you know literally say, okay, I wanna pay with this and it's gonna literally buy Bitcoin and use Bitcoin to pay, and you're gonna have like a three or four, five, six percent discount at the end of it, then people would do that, right? And you would do that. And there is actually this thing, it's called Fold App. Has anybody heard of this? Fold App. So yeah, check it out. Um, it's, it's, they do this, so they're doing this and they're trying to, um, it's currently only for Starbucks. Apparently if you, use their app, I don't know how they do it, but they, it, it, it amounts to like a 20% discount on Starbucks coffee, which is good, right? I mean, <laughs> it's just like Starbucks is expensive. Uh, so fold up, which is basically you use Bitcoin to pay and you ultimately end up getting a 20% discount on a Starbucks coffee, which is pretty neat, right? Um, and, and what they're trying to do is um, scale up to more retailers like you know, I, I think Whole Foods and, you know, yeah, we need discounts at Whole Foods, right? Uh, uh, okay, so just to conclude quickly. So I think some of the big takeaways are that, you know, Bitcoin has kind of, you know, been this um, controversial thing and every, you know, a lot of people, oh, it's, it's, it's crazy, it's going to fail, it's going to, you know, this is, um, there's too much volatility, there's too much failure, there's too much loss, there's too much bankruptcy, but that's how markets work. And markets are not perfect. And this is the, neat thing about Austrian economics is that we take this into account, right? We know that entrepreneurship and real life markets actually have failure and loss and they're not going to be perfect and neither is Bitcoin. And it's not going to be perfect and we shouldn't expect it to be. So anytime you see another company failing and you know somebody saying, oh, this is the end of it, no. You know, that, that's just normal. That's just how markets work. And it's for the first time, what is really interesting to me is that we are, it's a very rare moment that we're seeing competition in a monetary product, right, which, which doesn't really, it's a rare moment in history because it's currently largely unregulated still, and so there's just a lot of entrepreneurship, there's a lot of profit, there's a lot of loss, we're seeing a lot of, right, up and down, and it's extremely interesting to watch what competition in a monetary good looks like, and I mean, it's not going anywhere, Bitcoin, blockchain, definitely blockchain as well are, is kind of, you know, going to only get stronger. I mean, governments are starting to use the blockchain to set up property title registries, you know. So this technology is, is definitely here to stay. But at, at the base of it, I mean, we should all be kind of supportive and optimistic about something like Bitcoin, because ultimately what it's doing is creating a choice, right? I mean, even if today, as somebody in the United States, you don't really see a need to use it, but it's there. It gives you a choice, right? And if you needed to, you could use it, right? So, so, so somebody in Argentina, somebody you know, in a war zone, right? Think of them, right? It gives them a choice. And for that, it's, it's an extremely good thing, and we should all you know, be supportive of it for that reason. Okay, thank you.